Just open up in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for what took place through worship, Lord God, and through a word from you, Father God, that, Lord, uh, you direct a path for us, Father God, and, Lord, you want us to run this race, Lord God, with righteousness, Lord God. And we just ask you, Father God, as we share your word this morning, Father God, that, Lord, uh, it would not be dull, Father God, that our ears would be ready to receive and hear what you have to say, Father God. And as I was praying this morning with my wife this morning, Lord God, I love, I loved her prayer. She said, Lord, let us hear your word, Father God, through, your, through our ears. But, Lord God, that it would not go through the other ear, but from one ear to the heart. Not from one ear to the other ear, but from one ear to the heart. And that's what we pray, that your word, Father God, would just penetrate our hearts this morning as we hear your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 So, what month are we in? April. See, the month of April is considered the month of April showers. And as we all know, it's, it's a busy month and a historical month uh, with so many things going on, such as our taxes are due April 15th. Amen. Anybody file an extension? Um, the Titanic sank on April 15th, 1912. The Revolutionary War in America began on April 19th, 1775. The United States Congress was established on April 24th, 1800. Our first president of the United States, George Washington, was inaugurated on April 30th, 1789. Easter is typically celebrated in April. And if it's your birthday, happy birthday. If it's your birthday in April, happy birthday to you. Soon after Easter is over, it's marathon madness. The Boston Marathon is this Monday, tomorrow. There are 800 marathons. You guys know that marathons are very popular. There are 800 marathons that are organized every year, every year. But only six qualify as marathon, world marathon titles because they're prestigious, they're elite such as the Tokyo Marathon, London Marathon, the Berlin Marathon, the Chicago Marathon, the New York City Marathon, and Boston Marathon. The Boston Marathon. I don't know if you guys know that, that the, these marathons are considered elite and prestigious around the world. People from all over the world, all over the countries, they travel, they train, and they dream of winning th one of the major marathons. However, we have athletes who are more ambitious than others, elite runners, that are not satisfied by just winning one major marathon. They want all six. They want to place themselves in that elite position, winning that medal in Tokyo, winning that medal in London, winning that Berlin medal, winning that um, medal in Chicago, winning that medal in New York City, winning that medal tomorrow in Boston, and I don't know if you guys know that our Boston Marathon traditionally takes place on the third Monday in April on Patriots Day. Folks, our marathon is the oldest. I'm giving you a little history here. Our marathon is the oldest annual marathon in the world. Having, having been the first marathon in 1897, followed by the 1896 Olympics, it's... Is, it's, it's historical. And is anyone inspired to run and finish the marathon tomorrow, starting at Hopkins, Massachusetts, and ending on Boylston Street by any chance? Anybody running the marathon at Chrysler Rock? Anybody? Anybody back there? No? Next year? Next year? I, I, is anybody? I, it, it, seems, it seems so easy. It seems so easy. That's the start. That's the finish line. Oh, oh man. But let me share with you, whether you are an elite runner or just someone who is challenged uh, with finishing and crossing the finish line of any race, it's a good feeling when you finish something. It's a good feeling when you cross the finish line. Right, Gabi? It's a good feeling this morning that we finish Rock 101 with Gabi and Nayelis this morning. Amen? It's a good feeling when you finish something. Amen? However, the greatest feeling... The greatest feeling spiritually for us is to cross the finish line 
of our Christian and spiritual race and faith with the Lord. Folks, Jesus is our finish line. We, may ne- we, sh- we must never stop running this race. It's our goal to finish this spiritual race, enduring whatever it takes and whatever is ahead of us to tenaciously finish with him because he's our reward. He's our finish line. He's our reward. Heaven is our finish line, folks. The Lord's reward and our heavenly reward is heaven. It's greater than silver. It's greater than that silver medal. It's greater than that bronze medal. Folks, our reward is greater than any other of those medals. Whether it's gold, silver, or bronze. Because the scriptures tell us in Luke 6, 23, quickly, just one single verse. Rejoice when that happens. Leap for joy because you have a great reward in heaven. Can I say that one more time? Rejoice when that happens. When you cross that finish line, we get to heaven. We got to leap for joy with happiness because our great reward is in heaven. I love this quote from Arthur Dustin Benj, that heaven is a place of no mores. Heaven is a place of no mores. There will be no more pain. (laughs) There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more separation because death, the death, death will be conquered. No more. It's worth finishing the race to cross over from this world into a heavenly place in the presence and glory of our Lord and Savior. Brother Dave used the word privileged as he opened up. We're privileged, and we will be privileged. We will be privileged to enjoy his presence in heaven for eternity. See, when we finish this race, we, we, we have the opportunity and this, this, this privilege to see the Lord face to face our our Savior, who sacrificed so much and endured so much for sinners. We have the opportunity to live with the Lord forever. Amen? What a privilege. What an opportunity. Don't quit. See, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, you don't have to go there. We're going to have our supporting scripture, and we're just going to just bring this message home. And in, in um, the Gospel of John, folks, chapter 14, Jesus comforts his disciples. You know this story. And he tells his disciples, listen, do not let your hearts be troubled. I need you to believe in God, but you also have to believe in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you so that you will be there where I am, a place prepared for for people, for good people like you, for repenting people like us. Amen. Plenty of repenting, repentant. That's how we get to heaven. Amen. Repenting is a good thing. Amen. There's nothing wrong with repenting. Can we all say, I repent right now? I repent right now. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Folks, we, with all the sacrifice that the Lord has made, Father, and and, and our Heavenly Father, folks, we have this, this, this call to finish this race. We have to finish, folks. He specifically said, listen, I have a place for you, a prepared place for you. I've designed this place for you. I've accommodated this place for plenty of people and plenty of room. He's waiting for our arrival. But we're going to have to finish this race. We have to finish this race. We must finish this race strong and ask the Lord to provide that second wind. Anybody need a second wind? Amen. We need that second wind to finish this spiritual race. Amen. We can only obtain that second win from the Lord himself. You can't obtain it from nothing else. Undoubtedly, Jesus finished well. He finished his race well. Because although we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus finished well. That's a good finish right there. I don't know about you, but you should, we should be praising God. Give the Lord a shout because he finished well for you. For our sins. He ran an amazing race for sinners just like you and I. He never quits. He will never quit. And Jesus encourages us. It encourages us. And he wants our hearts to be heartened to run this race of life in faith. Because our faith starts with him and finishes with him. 
Amen? It starts with him. It finishes with him. Jesus is our finish line. I want you to uh, turn your Bibles over to our supporting scripture this morning. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 3. Amen. Are you guys still with me this morning? Amen? Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 3. Amen. Amen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance. Can we say endurance? Endurance, the race, the race that is set before us, looking to who? To Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against themselves so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being the founder, the perfecter of our faith, Lord God. Thank you for the joy that you took when you went on that cross for us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can everyone say amen to our supporting scripture? That's our supporting scripture for this morning, folks. And as we unpack the word this morning, I want us to focus on the first verse that mentions that if we're running this race set before us, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. The word therefore means consequently for that reason, which means that we have to pay attention to that therefore and go back to chapter 11 and go back before chapter 11. 11, we need to go back to chapter 10. Chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 11. That discloses, that discloses this long list of testimonies of great servants that ran this race with endurance and faith. They are our witnesses. Amen? Just like you and I are eyewitnesses from last week's message. I, eyewitnesses. They are our, our witnesses that have gone before us displaying their great race and faith and faith as they served the Lord. See, the people listed in Hebrews 11 ran the race. They trusted God and put their faith in action, resulting in our and being our witnesses. Okay? They left a monumental example to keep running this race set before us. They went before us and they gave us and they left us this example, this monumental example of us to run this race set before us. And in Hebrews chapter 11, discloses a reminder, a reminder of who was on that list, who dared to run the race, who dared to trust the Lord, who dared to, to have this faith to run this race. We'll start off with Abel. Abel's one of them. Enoch, who walked with, with God and did not experience death. Noah, Abraham, you know some of these stories. These men and women, they walked by faith. Sarah was one of them, one of the women named in the hall of faith. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Talk about Joseph's story. From the pit to the palace, had trusted the Lord, so much faith in the Lord. Moses, Rahab, a prostitute who's the second woman named in the hall of faith. Gideon, Barak, Samson, who never lost his faith despite his failures. Samson, j presided over Israel for six years. And David, my man David, who was not the perfect man, but a man after God's own heart. David was not perfect. We know the story of David. We know that he, his, his issues, his lust, adultery. We know all those things. He was a sinner, but he was a man after God's own heart. He wrote 73 out of 150 Psalms. And he, he wrote and expressed the love, the faith, and the trust he had for the Lord. He finished. He was on a race and he finished. Samuel. Folks, these are the recorded witnesses mentioned in our supporting scripture this morning. Amen. That therefore, those witnesses set before us. What should amaze us 
tell your neighbor, amazing. What should amaze us is the fact that these men and women mentioned were ordinary people just like us. But they were able to accomplish extraordinary things. They were ordinary, but through God, through the power of God, they were able to accomplish extraordinary things. And we know some of their stories. They were not perfect. They were not perfect. The Bible is full of imperfect people with a perfect God in pursuit of imperfect people. I'll say that again. The Bible is full of imperfect people with a perfect God in pursuit, in pursuit of imperfect people. That is us. That is us. See, all of them had flaws. We all have flaws, including this pastor that has this mic here. We all have flaws. We all have flaws. Look at, look at yourself in the mirror tomorrow and says, we all have flaws. I have flaws. And we all have flaws. And we know that from their stories at some point in their lives, some of these people were murderers. Some of these people were adulterers. Some of them were liars. Some of them were cowards. Some of them were, were doubters. Their resumes were not impressive because they weren't perfect people. My resume is not imp impressed because I'm a sinner. Your resume is as well. We're all sinners. We don't have that perfect resume for the Lord. We're all sinners. We all fall short of his glory. We can't be looking and submitting this perfect resume to the Lord. Look what I've done, Lord. It's not going to happen. Their resumes were not impressive whatsoever. They were not perfect. But they finished the race. And their calls becoming a great witness of clouds. That's what they did. They were faithful. They trusted the Lord. They believed in the Lord. They expected in the Lord. They're just obedient. Back to our supporting scripture. Therefore. All of that just to get to therefore. But it's the way we're supposed to break down the word of God. Therefore. Therefore, since we were surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Considered him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so they may not grow weary or faint hearted. See, as we know, we know that the Bible uses a lot of illustrations, a lot of metaphors to bring a point and a symbolic, and symbolically to captivate our attention. That's what a metaphor is. And the Bible uses a lot of metaphors, a lot of illustrations. And in this case, the writer is using a race, a marathon that we're so familiar with. And as I mentioned, there are about 800 popular and worldly marathons that are organized globally. And it takes training, right? Not just stretch up, stretch down, and I'll see you at Hopkinton tomorrow and go run that race. Amen? It takes training. It takes dedication. It takes discipline. It takes passion and love of a sport to compete. Think about that. Think about that, you know, it takes training. It takes dedication. It takes discipline. It takes passion. For the love of some, to, 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 to cross the finish line, to compete at that elite level. Let me ask you a question. What's the difference between athletes and us? What is the difference? Because these athletes train so hard, so hard, all their lives to improve just six seconds, five seconds, and one second. Wow, what about us? I hope you're getting that. I hope you are getting that. I'm not giving you any drama. I'm letting you know what the Lord is saying here today. Listen, think about how much athletes compete all their lives. Wow, he's got the world record. I just got to come in. I just got to compete. I just got to discipline myself. I just got to have this love for the sport so I can come in and beat the world record for just three seconds. How much effort are we doing with our own spiritual 
walk with the Lord to finish this race. Yes, you can give the Lord a shout of praise to finish this race. To finish this race. Think about an NBA athlete. He can work 25 years and 30 years of their life. And they might not make the NBA, but they give that passion, that discipline, that, that they give it their all. What about us? I need to take a break and have some holy water. Give me one second. Amen. God is good. God is speaking to us this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So, it takes a lot of perseverance. It takes a lot of endurance to finish and cross the finish line, folks. So just like an, an athlete, as believers, we're called to train spiritually. As well as have this dedication and discipline and passion with our race. See, the Hebrew writer gives us a training plan. Right in our scriptures, right in our supporting scriptures, there's a training plan. Just like a marathon runner has a 16 to 20 week plan to run a marathon, we also have a training plan on the race that has been set before us. However, however, say however, however, our plan is not measured in weeks in training. It's a plan for life. It's a plan for life. We cannot train to run this race, the spiritual race, for six weeks, 12 weeks, a month. It's, it's a life. It takes a life to run this plan. Amen? So, in order for us to run effectively, we need to lay aside every weight. This is God's plan for us to finish this race. Just like an athlete has years and years and years of planning, years of training, years of, of, of dieting, years of everything, we also have a plan as well. The first thing is that we need to lay aside every weight. See, we will never see a runner or an elite runner running with a suit. A jogging suit. Think about it. When have you seen an elite runner running with a running suit? What they do with that suit is they take it off and they run very light. Okay? So they lay aside everything that's heavy in order to run the race. And they run with extra light clothing. I don't know if you've noticed that. They run with really light, you know, weather-resistant, wind-resistant clothing. Okay? They want to make sure, they want to make sure that they are comfortable, and that nothing on their persons will distract them. Amen? And disrupt their abilities as they're running. Does that make sense? As simple as it seems, but it's so, so important for them not to be distracted with anything heavy on them whatsoever as they're running. Everything is stripped. Listen, everything is, is, is stripped, including, believe it or not, the tags that are behind their shirts. Okay, the tags that are on their pants, everything has to be as light as possible because they don't want anything to cause any discomfort whatsoever. Okay, that tag in the back can cause that runner some discomfort. That tag, believe it or not, and this is what I'm sharing with you, it's, it's, it's the experts have shared these things here. Think about yourself. Has anybody in their lifetime ever, oh man, this is bothering me, oh, and take and rip the tag off. Same thing with them. The problem is they got to make sure that nothing is hindering them in discomfort whatsoever to run this race. Because what's going to happen if you have that tag and once in your lifetime where you've tried to take rid of that tag and you pull it, I just can't get it out. I'm going to have to get some scissors. So as they're running that 15 mile and they feel so uncomfortable and something is just in the back or in the front of their pants or inside of their pants that's disrupting them, it's going to cost them the race because it's weighing on them and distracting them. Am I making sense? Listen what the experts say. Every ounce of excessive fabric or bulky material is a hindrance to the fluid motion that defines a runner's stride. Wow. 
Yes, that little tag, okay, that little tag can cause a distraction. Even, even the color, the colors as these runners are racing tomorrow, if you're watching from home, drinking a cup of coffee and, and, and just relaxing and watching these runners, you're going to see that the colors that they have are important as well. You'll never see a runner wearing light-colored clothing during a marathon. You know why? Because if they wear that light-colored marathon clothing, it's going to cost something mentally. And what happens is when you wear light-colored clothing and you're running, what happens is you start to see the sweat. And all of a sudden, mentally, the runner's thinking, am I dehydrating as quickly as I thought I was going to dehydrate before crossing the finish line. Even those details are so important. The dark colored clothing is, is, is their choice because dark colored clothing sucks up everything, the sweat marks, and it helps the runners feel more comfortable and confident during the race because they're not seeing anything physical in their bodies. Folks, similarly, with us spiritually, folks, we are called, listen, to lay aside every weight that may trip us up spiritually. Preventing us from running the race all the way to the finish line. Every single thing that slows us down towards our race that has been set before us. That little weight, that little sin, okay? Laying aside means letting go of anything and everything that hinders and separates us from our relationship with God. Okay? So what do we must do? What's our game plan? What's part of the plan here? We must take off and throw off. Take off and throw off any hindrances that will gradually slow us down, disrupting our race to cross the finish line with Jesus. Think about all I shared with you with all the details of a runner. What are the things that hinder us? Those little simple things. Maybe, maybe you don't think, maybe you don't think that, that maybe taking like 15, you don't know what 15 minutes of your time to pray can do. And you say to yourself, well, I don't think that's enough. Yes, it is. It is enough. Every minute, every second counts. Because the devil is at work every minute, every second to slow you down. So you may not think that that 15 minutes of prayer is, is long enough. Yes, it is. It's not how long you pray. It's desiring how much you want to pray. It's not how long you pray. It's desiring how much you want to pray, how much you want to be in the presence of God, even in your car, even at, the, at, at your break, somewhere. Listen, it all counts. But we get slowed down with the enemy schemes to slow us down gradually, to slow us down gradually, to slow down your devotional, to slow down your reading, to slow down your prayer, to slow down your attendance at church, to slow down your, 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 the community that we're supposed to have in church, to slow all those things. Those things slowly and gradually will hinder your race, our race, to finish this race. Plain and simple. Philippians 3.8 quickly says this, nothing is as wonderful as knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, I have given up everything. Can we say everything? Everything else and count it all as garbage. All I want is Christ. All I want is Jesus. Nothing more and nothing less. All I want is Christ. That's all I want. That's all we should want. We want to cross the finish line. He's waiting for us at the finish line. We're called to finish this race wholeheartedly. With Jesus, not run with the things of this world that are weighing us down. Wow. And it could be the simplest things that are weighing you down. It could be the simplest things. I ask you this question. Is that cell phone the first thing you pick up in the morning? Social media. What's going on? Is it the news? Is it this? Is it the next, the next cooking dish? That's gone viral. What is it? That little, that little, that little desire right there. That's simple as just picking up the phone. Will slowly, gradually 
slow down your race because you get entertained. And we all do that. Amen. It's so quiet in here. But the Lord is speaking. Amen. Some good stuff. Amen. Amen. So number two. So in order to run effectively, what we need to do is this. We need to lie, lay aside every sin that clings so closely. Every sin. Now we're being more specific here. It's that sin that easily distracts and trips up, trips up the believer in the race of life. It's that sin that easily distracts and trips us up, folks. It's that carnal and worldly lust that ambushes the believer. Ambushes. I love I loved that word, that ambushes us. Because that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants to come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why you have to be sober-minded and alert and ready because the enemy comes to devour, folks. So you have to be alert, sober, alert. Because if you're alert, you stay alive in Christ. Because he wants to ambush us. And he wants to ambush us. And he wants those things, the sins of this world to cling so closely. 1 John 2.16 says, For everything in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Those three things. Listen to 1 John 2.16 from the Amplified Version. It's not up there. For all that is in the world. I love this translation. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Present, pretentious confidence in one's resources or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world. We must strip off, listen, the lust of the flesh. I'm telling you, we need to strip off the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life to effectively run this life, this race. Folks, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they are heavy. They are heavy. They will slow you down. You will be out of shape spiritually. Hallelujah. You will be out of shape. We will be out of shape. It's the we principle here, including the person that holds this mic. It's the we principle. Not you. It's we. We, the church. They are heavy. Number three. In order for us to run effectively, we have to run with endurance. We have to run with endurance. As we train and we start to lay aside every weight and all the things that are clinging onto us, upon releasing the weight and the sin, folks, upon releasing th those, those, those things that are clinging, the sin, upon releasing them and repenting, we start to pick back up our pace. Hallelujah. Thank God we can still pick up our pace. And we start picking up spiritual endurance for the Lord. And we start picking it up, folks, because we're not overloaded with garbage. We're not overloaded with garbage and the things that are hindering us. It allows, to, it allows us to pick up our pace, to pick up our stride as we continue running this race, folks. We are running the race with God's essentials, folks, because... It's what we need. The Lord is our finish line. He's got godly essentials for this plan. Listen, all we need to do is keep on running this race. Loving God. Seeking God. Worshiping God. Oh, I need a second wind. Oh, I need a second wind. So start fearing God and obeying God. Those are the essentials of God. It's not power aid. It's God, the loving God, the God that you seek, the God that you worship, the God that fears, that you fear God, that you obey God, that's, 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 this, this is the God that, get, that empowers you. And you're not going to need power aid. Right? You're not going to need any, any of those drinks that you need. What you need to be is in the presence of the Lord, and he will ignite and refuel you and give you that second win. We all need it. We all need it. We all need it. And it's, it's the result of perseverance. It's the result of endurance as the Lord provides that second win. As he provides that second win to finish our race strong. Number four. A one, two, three, four plan. Amen. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. 
we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. See, runners in athletic competition, we all know, as it's been stated, that they can't be distracted by anything. Their focus is on that race, those who are cheering them on to that finish line. Folks, as runners in the race of life, we must also fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. The word perfecter biblically translates to literally meaning something, to bring something to conclusion. Perfecter is a completer. It's a finisher. See, when we run with perseverance and keep our eyes on Jesus, we are encouraged and heartened because there's no, see, see when, when you get that second win, there's, 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 there's nothing better than that second win because you're keeping your eyes on Jesus, okay? You're keeping your eyes on the finish line, which is Jesus. There's no other destination. He's our final destination, and he's our finish line. So there's no distractions whatsoever when we keep our eyes on Jesus. That's it. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Seeking and keeping our eyes on Jesus, it gives us that second wind. It gives us that second wind. All of us at some point in this race have felt like quitting. Like runners. Their mind and body are telling them to quit. And all of a sudden, someone along gives him a word of encouragement. That runner that's going on. Mile 18, maybe that family member who's running for a cause, they're on mile 20, and that family member who they're running for, or that cause, or that organization, and they're cheering them on, and all of a sudden that runner gets that, that second win. There are only five more miles to go. You can do this. And can I tell you, you can do this because the Holy Spirit is telling you that we can do this. The same thing happens for us. The Holy Spirit is along us, aside us, encouraging us to keep on going. And en enabling us to go further and further. Because it's not by power nor by might, but it's by thy spirit. That's our, our power aid. It's the Holy Spirit is our, our, our aid to get that second win. In the scriptures, additionally, they tell us that we're able to do what? All things through Christ who strengthens us, folks. We're able to do all things through Christ. We're able to get that second wind that through him, through the Holy Spirit, we're infused, we're strengthened, we're empowered to finish this race if we maintain our discipline and training to lay aside every weight, to lay aside every sin that clings so closely, to, lay, to, to run this race with endurance. Plain and simple, and to keep our eyes on Jesus. That's the plan. Can we go back up to um to the marathon plan? That's busy. That's really busy. God's giving us four points, four biblical points. To lay aside every weight, to lay aside every sin that clings so closely, to run with endurance, and to keep our eyes on Jesus. That's busy. <laughs> Listen, as I close, fellas, you can stand with me. Jesus <laughs> knows how to finish. Jesus knows how to finish. We can learn from the greatest finisher, Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, what God starts, he finishes in victory. He finished his race at the cross for all of us, folks. He endured the cross and he took it all at the cross when he was crucified for the joy that was set before him. Do you know what that joy was? Us. That joy was us. I'm here to tell you, this is not a motivational preaching or teaching. This is the word of God. We need to understand this, folks. We need to understand this, folks. That joy was for us. Jesus is a finisher. He knows how to finish well. And he included, when he was at the cross, he included that criminal. He included that criminal. That criminal repented at the cross with Jesus. Jesus is a good finisher. What did Jesus say to that guy? Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus is a finisher, and he allows us to finish with him. And shortly after he took his last breath, he said, it is finished. 
Jesus is a good finisher. He's a great finisher. Jesus know how to, knows how to finish. However, that line, that, that race was not easy. And this race for you and I is not easy. It's not easy. But I'm here to tell you that there's a finish line. There is a finish line. But the enemy's going to throw everything he can to hinder us from finishing this race. I need you to understand that. Everything. Everyone likes to win. Jesus, I can't take that call right now. Listen to me, guys. Everyone likes to win. No one likes to lose a race. So why should we lose this race? No one likes to lose a race. There's a champion inside of you. you you're competitive with so many things. And we don't like to lose. So why are we going to allow the enemy schemes to hinder us, to, tri to trip us up so we don't cross the finish line? 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25 says, you've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes run. Everyone who runs, one, one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. I want to say that one more time. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. Congratulations to whoever wins the Boston Marathon. But there's more to winning a medal. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. And I'm speaking here figuratively to us, Church Christ the Rock. I know no one's running the marathon tomorrow. But we have an everyday spiritual marathon race for this life. This marathon does not require 16 to 20 weeks of training or preparation. We're called to train and discipline our lives every day. Every day, it's a lifetime, laying aside every weight, laying aside every sin that clings so cl closely, running with endurance and keeping your eyes on Jesus. It's every day. Each day when you step on the race, the race of life, remember this. I need you to remember this. I need that clear image. Is that clear image up there of one, two, and three, the track. Do we have that? Did we put it out, Beto? Should be there. Okay, I just want you to keep your eyes on lane one, lane two, and lane three. That's a track. And I want you to understand that there are runners accompanying us as a reminder and encouragement to finish the race. Lane one is a reminder of a crowd, a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. They're in lane one. They're a great reminder, an example of how we should finish and how we should finish well, despite, despite how imperfect we are, okay? I want you to place your eyes on lane two. Lane two is you. Lane two is us. It's your race. It's your race. It's our race. So lay aside every sin that clings so closely. Lane number three. I want you to put your eyes on lane number three. Lane number three is Jesus. He's running beside you. He's running beside us, encouraging us to finish well. To finish well. He will give you that second wind. He's the one that's going to be cheering you on. Don't give up. Because something happens when we don't give up. Something happens when we don't give up on the promises of God. See, Jesus is not looking to see which one of you finishes first, second or third. All he wants to do is for us to finish this race. So he can receive us with open arms, one by one. Here comes Rosa. Here comes Melvin. Here comes Christian. Here comes Matt. Here comes my sister back there, that sister back there. 
all of us, all of us. Here they come. Can we finish well? Can we give the Lord a shout of praise for finishing this race? Amen. What I'm going to do is close. I'm going to invite Brother Dave up to the platform here, right where you're at. We're going to take a few moments, and we're going to pray for this nation. War that's taking place in Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Iran, all the things that are happening in our country. And also, can you guys do me a favor? I don't care, and we don't care what part of the city or town you live in. Pray for the city of Boston because when we travel, when we travel and where people ask us, we say, we're from Boston, we're from Boston. We're having hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people in Boston tomorrow. We want to pray for protection over our city. Pray along with me. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's join our hearts as we seek the Lord. Oh, Father, we just want to first thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And, oh, God, we pray that you would strengthen us, Lord, to run with endurance the race which is marked out for us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we pray your word would go deep into our hearts, Lord. And, God, we just declare that the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all who dwell therein. For he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Lord, we thank you that God, that this planet is yours. The earth doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to God. And Lord, you are the Lord of all those who live upon this planet. So God, the premise that we come before you is that God, we need you. Because Lord, things are chaotic, Lord. And I know that Father, that even in the midst of all this chaos, Lord, there's a countdown happening. We're coming closer and closer to the end of the age where Christ will return. And so, Lord, though things are out of control, Father, we also, Lord, are commanded in Scripture to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so, God, we're crying out as your people, Lord. Have mercy, God. Have mercy on, on Israel, Lord. Have mercy on Israel, Lord. Have mercy, Lord, on all the people that live in the Middle East, Lord. And God, we pray that, God, that you would give uh, the nations of the world wisdom, Lord. But God, Lord, there is no wisdom apart from you. There's no wisdom. There's no one who says, let's cry out to God. And so, Lord, as the church of Jesus Christ, we're crying out to you, Father. Intervene, Lord, we pray. Intervene because, Lord, you're not done. The gospel still has to go forth. And we just pray that, God, that the church would be mobilized to pray. Because, Lord, you said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations. And so, Lord, we're praying that, God, that you would have mercy on all the peoples, Lord. We think of all the worn, torn, the worn, torn countries, Lord, that are out there, Father. War is, seems to be everywhere, God. And, Lord, with Iran and this new attack, God, we just pray, Lord, you would expose every evil plan that you would thwart oh god every plan lord that will destroy life in the name of jesus and lord we pray that god that the gospel would continue to go forth in the middle east the gospel would continue to go forth throughout the whole world and lord we're praying oh god 
Lord, move. Move on our nation, oh God. And Lord, we just know that, Father, that we need mercy. There needs to be a turning to God in this nation. And so, Lord, we're praying that, God, you would, in spite of our sins and in spite of our pride and in spite of all the things we trust in besides you, you'd have mercy because, Lord, the Lord is slow to anger and rich in compassion. The Lord is rich in loving kindness. And we pray, Lord, you would not treat us as our sins deserve. So, Lord, as we think of the marathon tomorrow, we're praying for protection over civilians, over law enforcement. We're also praying, God, that you would expose every evil plot in the name of Jesus. It is God who brings things into the light. Nothing gets in the light unless God allows it. And so, Father, we're asking. Lord, the Bible says we have not because we ask not. And so, Lord, we're asking, Lord, that you would bring to light every evil plot in the name of Jesus. You would protect this city in Jesus' name. We're praying, Lord, for the protection of Jerusalem, that Iran would think twice, Lord, from launching any more missiles, Lord. And God, we pray, God, we pray, Lord, that you would intervene, oh God. Lord, as we pray, God, Lord, there are people that are hurting. We pray that, God, that many people would call upon the name of the Lord. That, God, that people wouldn't be hardened because of these atrocities that are happening. But, God, people would begin to cry out for the God of mercy. And, Lord, we pray that, God, as the church, we would not be prayerless, but we would be prayerful. And that, God, that your people that are called by your name will humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, reveal to us our wicked ways, Lord. Reveal to us those weights that are keeping us from running the race with endurance. The sins, the little sins, the big sins that are keeping us from finishing the race. And, O oh God, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross, scorning its shame. He sat down at the right hand of God. Therefore, don't become weary in your struggle against sin. And so, Father, we're praying for protection. We're praying for the nations, Lord, that there would be a turning to God, that there would be that leaders would humbly cry out for God's mercy. Lord, it seems almost impossible for that to happen, but God, I know that, Lord, that you can soften hearts, begin to soften the leaders of the United States of America, Lord. Grant them repentance, Lord. Grant everyday people repentance, Lord. Grant your people repentance because repentance is a good thing. It's where we restart. It's where we begin. Amen. And Lord, we just ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed. Hallelujah.